So in this video we're going to be covering chapter 8 section 1 which is describing chemical reactions. Now chemical reactions are the processes by which one substance or more substances will turn into one or more uh, different substances. So for example substance A will become substance B. Now the initial substances that you start with over here are what are known as the reactants, that is the things that will be reacting and then substance B, that is the uh, things that end up, the final materials that uh, result from the reaction, are what are known as the products of the reaction. And we usually describe chemical reactions using what are known as uh, chemical equations. Now these chemical equations use the symbols and formulas that we've already discussed how to make based on a substance makeup uh, in order to balance and obey the law of conservation of mass. That is basically mass can't be created or destroyed. You have to have the same on one side, that is in this case substance A, as you do on the other side once you're finished with the reaction. So for example, if we use a formula for ammonium dichronate, which is ammonium, Again, you collectively use the polyatomic ion as though it were one element. Oh, that's two chromium. And then you react it, you end up with nitrogen along with other compounds. And you'll notice if you do all the distributing based on. Uh, this coefficient right here, and you do all the math and add it all up, you'll find that you have the same number of each element on the left side, that is the reactants, as you do on the right side in the products. And this is because, again, of the law of conservation of mass. You have to have the same amount of material you go into a reaction as you do on the other side. You can't simply destroy uh, mass. So now we're going to be looking at some basic indications that a chemical reaction has occurred. So of course to know for certain that a chemical reaction has occurred, you have to look at the materials that went in and the materials that go out and make sure that there has been a change in the uh, actual chemical makeup of the, of the materials. However, there are some pretty basic indications that a chemical reaction has occurred that will strongly indicate that there's a change in material. For example, if you have, say, a beaker like this, and you throw in one substance and another substance together, and they release uh, light, or if they start to heat up, then there's a pretty strong indication that there's been a chemical reaction because bonds have been broken and atoms have been rearranged, releasing this energy as heat and light. As well, if you had a beaker with some sort of liquid and you added another chemical in, then if there were gas bubbles that started to form at the top or anywhere with the mixture, then that would be an indication that a different chemical is formed because it's rare that without adding energy in the form of heat that you would spontaneously get a gas uh, from two of the same materials. However, if you formed a new compound within this mixture after reacting that was gaseous at room temperature, then you would start to see bubbles within this uh, solution. And those bubbles would be an indication of the presence of the new chemical compound. Similarly, if you were to mix these two solutions right here and have some sort of solid start accumulating at the bottom, where there was no solid before, you could also assume that some sort of chemical reaction has taken place because if you have two liquids and then all of a sudden uh, a solid appears, that's obviously a new material because again that's solid at whatever temperature reacting whereas before the uh, chemicals you were reacting were liquid at that temperature and without adding or removing energy it's very unlikely that you would get a uh, solid forming from the same materials that you put in. Finally, if you 
mix some chemicals within a beaker and all of a sudden it changes color let's say it goes from this blue color to this pink color uh, that would also be an indication of the presence of a different chemical material than what you started with because as you'll remember different compounds absorb and release light at different uh, quantum energies like we discussed in the Bohr model so if you're seeing a different color you're seeing a different frequency of light being released by the material which means you're seeing a different material altogether so chemical equations which I briefly discussed earlier and one of which I have listed below are very useful tools because they can describe mathematically uh, chemical chemical change rather however this only works if you understand some characteristics that will help you uh, use this tool correctly so first of all the chemical equation like the one I have written here uh, must represent known facts that is you have to know what reactants and products you have coming into and out of the uh, reaction respectively uh, either through experimentation or through a trusted source, i.e. your chemistry textbook or an online source with some uh, reputation too. If you don't actually know what reactants and products are uh, being used in the reaction, you can't accurately describe how they form using math because you obviously don't understand it at the most basic level. Now, furthermore, this equation not only must contain the correct reactants and products, it also has to con contain the correct formulas uh, for these products. For example, if I had H3O over here, when we get down to the third law and discuss uh, the law of conservation of mass, which states that you have to have the same number of each type of atom on each side, because atoms in most chemical reactions aren't created or destroyed, if you had the wrong formula for water, what would happen is it would throw off the reaction, the number of hydrogens you would have on either side, and it would appear as though, once you balance the equation correctly, that uh, four hydrogens magically appeared, which we know simply isn't the case. Now, uh, these correct formulas also require uh, close attention to detail. For example, if you were to forget that nitrogen is diatomic when it's an element all by itself, it would again throw off uh, your reaction and you wouldn't get the right ratios of different compounds once you found the products. Finally, chemical equations have to obey the law of conservation of mass. That is, you cannot uh, create or destroy any atoms in uh, most chemical reactions. Now, in order to compensate for this, since you can't change the chemical formula without changing the actual compound you'd be discussing, uh, you'll notice that if you were to simply count up the number of hydrogen atoms, or nitrogen atoms over here, using this subscript, you would get two nitrogen and two nitrogen, and then again, two chromium and two chromium. However, once you get to the hydrogen, once you distribute this, you get eight hydrogen over here, and if you were just uh, say that it reacts to form water, you'd only get two hydrogen over here. So the way you uh, compensate for this, that is, obey the law of conservation of mass, is by using what are known as uh, coefficients. Now, these coefficients list how many uh, of each compound are created or disassembled during a chemical reaction. So if you take this coefficient for water over here and multiply it by the two hydrogens, you get eight hydrogens over here in the products to match the eight hydrogens that are over here in the reactants. And it is by changing the ratio of uh, chemical compounds to the other compounds within that uh, chemical reaction that you are able to obey the law of conservation of mass. Similar to these chemical equations, you can also write what are known as uh, word equations uh, for a reaction. And these just use the names of the reactants and products to give qualitative information without obeying the law of conservation of mass. So for example, you would write ammonium dichromate, which I'm not going to write out because it is quite a long uh, name for a chemical. And then this arrow, 
which you use in the reaction to show the products, uh, translate to the word yields. So you would say ammonium dichromate yields nitrogen, uh, chromium-3 oxide, and water. Again, this is without including any information such as coefficients to obey the law of conservation. So delving further into the syntax of chemical equations, uh, we'll talk about some symbols. Uh, first of all, we've already covered this arrow symbol, which is uh, yields, and this is used to indicate the change in arrangement of atoms from the uh, reactants to the products. Similarly, there is a symbol which is a double arrow, which is used for reactions in which the products can then turn back into uh, reactants. And then to specify the states of various chemicals, we use uh, abbreviations within parentheses. Now I'll explain what each of these means in just a bit. So in this reaction, you would react uh, methane gas with oxygen gas, which is why we use the G in each symbol. And then as a replacement for the G in the products, you can also use an upward arrow because if you do a reaction within solution the uh, products will rise to the top as a gas. Similarly if we had a precipitate in solution that formed it would sink down to the bottom of the flask or whatever you were using and so instead of an upward arrow if it forms a precipitate a product can be put next to a downward arrow to indicate that it's a solid. Similarly, this AQ indicates an aqueous solution of something, for example, uh, hydrochloric acid diluted in water, uh, and this is used so that uh, you can indicate when you mix two diluted solutions uh, over here to form something else in the products. And then the solid is also used, let's say you just put some aluminum foil in with hydrochloric acid or whatever, you can indicate that this is a solid piece of aluminum foil by using this abbreviation.